G'day you mob, Pete here, and this is another episode of Aussie English, the number one place for anyone and everyone wanting to learn Australian English. So, today I have a GOSS episode for you where I sit down with my old man, my father, Ian Smithson, and we talk about the week's news, whether locally down under here in Australia or (laughs) non-locally overseas in other parts of the world, okay? And we sometimes also talk about whatever comes to mind, right? If we can think of something interesting to share with you guys related to us or Australia, we also talk about that in the GOSS. So, these episodes are specifically designed to try and give you content about many different topics where we're obviously speaking in English and there are multiple people having a natural and spontaneous conversation in English. So, it is particularly good to improve your listening skills. In order to complement that though, I really recommend that you join the podcast membership or the academy membership at aussieenglish.com.au where you will get access to the full transcripts of these episodes, the PDFs, the downloads, and you can also use the online PDF reader to read and listen at the same time, okay? So, if you really, really want to improve your listening skills fast, get the transcript, listen and read at the same time, keep practicing, and that is the quickest way to level up your English. Anyway, I've been rabbiting on a bit. I've been talking a bit. Let's just get into this episode, guys. Smack the bird and let's get into it. Yeah, so sheer shortage driving record prices for Australian white shedding Shedding sheep. sheep. I yeah. had never heard of this sheep prior Shedding to this Shedding sheep, haven't you? Uh, there's a few. No. With, uh, somebody I was talking to recently um, actually had them. They were they were breeding them and <laughs> and um, and selling them. So they'd be a little easier as a pet if you wanted a pet sheep that you didn't have to worry about shearing. A, yeah, um, the trouble is though they shed sheep. Well, yeah, that'd be like any, any animal so though, like, like a, a dog or yeah, a cat. It's like a long haired dog that's just going to be shedding. Um, hair all over the place all the time. Yeah, but, but they're in the field. Who cares? Yeah, it's well, outside, exactly. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, anyway, so this ram sale in uh, New South Wales, the Central Tablelands, there was a record for the sale of a ram, an yes. Australian white sheep, for one hundred and sixty-five thousand dollars. Yes, isn't that crazy? So this was at the eighth annual Tatty Keel Australian White <laughs> Stud, um, I guess, meetup or you know some kind of event, mm. and the ram was called White Gold. For obvious reasons. Exactly right. Yeah. <laughs> so it set an Aussie record across all meat sheep breeds. Several other rams, though, also would have broken the previous record at that um that yeah, meter. That's about four times the average price over the last four years for a yeah. stud ram. So, well, the average uh, stud ram was forty thousand dollars, and a flock yeah. ram is fifteen thousand. And the yeah. sale at this uh, eighth Tatty Keel um, stud meetup thing was five point five million dollars worth of. I guess studs, stud, and they'll be stud hands. use as well. So yeah, yeah, Jesus, which aren't worth anywhere near as much money. But yeah, yeah. So the Australian white breed developed was developed only a decade ago or so by Taddy Keel, um, and it was bred to produce hair instead of wool, so that farmers didn't have to pay shearers if they were just interested in raising um, sheep for meat. Yes, which I thought you know makes a lot of sense. I wonder how the how the genetics though differs. I imagine that it's. You know, we think of hair and wool as being these very two different things like feathers and hair, but it, mm. I assume that wool is just hair that crinkles and that doesn't fall out seasonally. And it doesn't fall out as easily. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, um, all you've so had to do is select cutting. for a sheep that loses its wool um, mm. on a regular basis, which would have been the default genetics yeah. of the animal and make yeah. sure that the hair is straight. Yeah. Or it doesn't even have to be straight. It just has to fall out. Yeah, <laughs> so well, it yeah, never true. gets long enough to, do, to become that sort of curly thing. But so, it looks like, it. These sheep kind of look like um, Labrador, just, white they Labrador They just look dogs, like white Labradors. Right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, it's pretty cool, but it makes a lot of sense. And I think a big driving factor was apparently the fact that we are obviously in a pandemic, but as a result, we don't have many shearers around. And mm. so, you would imagine that despite them being scarce, they're also going to become more expensive to hire, which impacts your, you know, top end when you're- Yes. Your top margin when you're trying to shear wool or shear sheep that you're going to use for meat in the future. So, obviously, if you can just make sure the hair falls out naturally, you don't have to worry about paying shearers at all. And- um 
you can just harvest them for meat. So yeah, and look, the wool from um, typically from breeds that are made for uh, the meat market, the wool is almost worthless. Mm. So yeah, yes, you'll make a little bit of money on it. So, but uh, yeah, you'll probably it's probably about cost neutral. I think in terms of you make your money back on the shearing by selling the wool. But, yeah, uh, because they're it, they're only they're only cut to make the animals' lives easier. Um, yeah, and well, the animals haven't been bred disease. to have good quality wool. They've been exactly. bred to have good meat. Yeah. And yeah, typically, so- they're, typically the um, the ones that they're um, sacrificing for meat are, um, are lambs. Anyway, mm-hmm. they're you know, less than a year old, so yeah, you know, they're not they're never going to um, to. You don't have the problem with the ones that you're actually sacrificing. The problems you have is the breeding ewes and rams um, that have to be shorn. So. Yeah, but it was interesting they were talking about whether or not it would stand the test of time because they weren't sure if it was going to be a fad or not. As soon as the pandemic ends or until, and as soon as restrictions end, are we going to get an influx of shearers where it no longer becomes viable to buy these really expensive uh, straight well, away sheep? they won't be that expensive. Just- yeah, they won't be that expensive. I think the difference, and I know the article um, talked about you know, the analogy with the uh, the emu market, mm-hmm. you know, farming emus. The trouble with farming emus is that there was never a downstream product. That was just <laughs> speculation on there being a downstream product for mm-hmm. emu feathers um, and for meat. And yeah, there is a market for those, but it's a very small niche market. And so the idea that you know, thousands of people went out there and created emu farms was just never going to work. Um, you know, but in this case... The market is there. We know that the market is there for you know lambs for you know meat, um, and in this case, all it is is an economic decision is to say whether it's going to be worth taking this breed, yeah, which saves you money in shearing, um, or whether you can take a cheaper breed and shear them. Um, so there'll be a balance in the price. Yes, it might be that you know the one hundred and sixty five thousand dollar ram. It's going to take a lot of time over the next few years for that that ram to you know pay his his dues back. Um, but you know, who knows? You know, I doubt whether that price will will maintain itself, but there will still be value and there'll still be people who go, this is much easier. It's much easier to just farm these sheep rather than having ones that we've got to worry about shearing. So assuming mm. that there is a balance, that there's no significant difference in cost and effort to farm these in comparison with anything else other than the shearing component. I mean, I don't know whether these are more susceptible or less susceptible to disease or require different, you know, fencing or, you know, there's all sorts of other things to, you know, keeping sheep that are going to, you know, influence the cost. But assume that they're all equal, then if you can balance the payment for shearing as against not paying for shearing with the price of these, then it'll, it'll find its place in the market, I'm sure. Yeah, I wonder if they get fly struck as much as normal sheep. If they're, I don't know what the length of their wool would get to, but I wonder. How, I would, I would like to see one of these sheep at the end, right before it started shedding. You know, at the end of winter, to yeah. see w- w- they, what is the actual length. If of they the hair. do, I, I don't know whether they. And the article wasn't, you know, typically was fairly short on, <laughs> you know, biology Info. of the uh, of the animal. Um, there was more about the you know, the fact that they exist. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I don't know whether they are continuous shedders or annuals or seasonal shedders. So if they're continuous, then they're going to have this you know, you know constant low level of of um, hair over them. Um, the other thing to note is whether they're also whether you can also have them in a variety of different environments because often um, you know, yeah meat sheep. Uh, are more susceptible because they don't have the long, fast-growing wool. They're typically more susceptible to you know, cold and frost and those sort of things. So um, whether they're you know, going, that's going to be the problem for them, we don't know. So, um, and I don't know enough about the you know, the breed itself. So, so do you reckon? Interesting idea. Do you reckon it'll last? Are you expecting to see that um, shedding sheep take over the the meat industry in Australia? I don't know that it'll take over. I think it might be that in some circumstances it's going to be you know, economically beneficial to have them, and that's what people are going to choose to do. Mm. If it turns out that you know, regardless of the shearing price, these are just producing better quality, cheaper meat, then it's going to be you know, they're going to become much more popular. But well, and um, as you say, to be it's, seen. it's probably going to matter where you live, and if you live in a place that gets you know relatively cold temperatures, even if it's only a few days a year. Yeah. Or for a small, a short period of time during the year, you may have to just cut your losses and choose a sheep that grows wool in order to be able to endure that. Yeah. Whereas yeah. if you live somewhere where it's really hot, there's obviously then multiple reasons for you to be mm-hmm. like, well, now we don't have to remove the wool because of the heat or anything yeah, like that. Exactly. It just so. deals with it itself. 
Yeah, yeah interesting do you, one. Do you remember any big changes happening with other livestock or other, say, vegetables or fruit in the past for you that have made massive, I don't know, made massive changes or differences in in terms of their their growing? Like, did you grow up with bananas that had seeds? No. That was way before my time. That was before you? Yeah. 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 Were there, did, do you know of any but I've changes? Eaten, I've eaten that plantains, have... which we don't get in Australia. Yeah. Uh, but you go to South America and Central America and plantains, which are effectively native bananas, um, you know, I've eaten them, uh, but not in Australia. So. I can't remember the last time I had grapes that had seeds in them. Yeah, you're probably right. I think they've just sort of gone off. People just prefer grapes without seeds. And, yeah. You know, so it's not that those, you know, varieties of grapes are not around but clearly yeah. they're just they're not, not in the selling them and they're not in the supermarkets you may be able to get them at you know vegetable markets or fruit and vegetable markets and things but i don't know awesome. the one that sorry the one that comes to mind which again was um which was a sort of niche market thing and they still they're still around but the and that was the the sheep the, the wool sheep that you don't need to shear uh because they they grew a weak spot in their wool. Um, I think mm. it was a change of diet or something. I can't remember the specific instance, but it was something that happened down annually where you could change the diet of them and it would create a weak spot in them and effectively the whole fleece would just fall off. Wow. And, and we so, just go and pick it up. And so, you know, you'd see these sheep, flocks of sheep running around with covers on them. So they were clean uh, and they were covered. And then the effectively the fleece would just effectively fall off them. So it's like a snake um, shedding its skin or something. Yeah, and they, <laughs> it comes and off I, in I a single piece. They were just they were just way too expensive to keep. It's sort of yeah. this little niche, cutesy little niche market. And I think the the quality of the wool is obviously very good. Um, and yeah, you get a high price for it, but it probably doesn't warrant all of the you know crapping around you've got to do in order to uh, to get it yeah, chasing the sheep down and grabbing them and then peeling yeah, them like yeah, a banana peeling the, yeah, take your <laughs> overcoat off yeah i can't imagine i guess you'd want more control over it right yeah and look there's always been uh, certainly within the uh, the livestock market there have always been geographic variations on which breeds of say cattle um are used for yeah. um, particularly you know beef cattle uh, rather mm -hmm. than dairy but uh, the further north you go the more you know you get into breeds that cope with tropical environments you know hot and humid environments and are also more resistant to things like ticks and, and yep. so on whereas they don't thrive as well in cold weather uh, but the cold weather breeds just can't cope as soon as you move to north queensland so um i'm trying to look up chicken change over the years because that would have been my best example, I think, of changing biology. And this is just selection. But, um, yeah, there it is. Okay. Yeah, so, big in 1957, <laughs> chickens weighed 905 grams when they were obviously harvested to be eaten. 1978, they were 1 1.8 kilos. So, they doubled in size. Yeah. And in 2005, they were 4.2 kilos. <laughs> it's just insane. And so, they're like these just goliaths that i think in the in the sheds where they're grown they can't even stand up once they're mm. almost at the being harvested stage like they can they can stand up and walk around a little bit but they get so tired so quickly because of the muscle mass yeah that yeah, it is another ethical kind of you know dilemma mm. is, and they're chicken. bred for those uh, chickens well they're roosters the ones that we you know killed to eat uh, they're bred for um Breast mass, breast meat yeah. mass, so that yeah, because there's now a, there's a huge market in in butchered chicken meat, as in not just here's a whole chicken, you know, go and roast it, which used to be yeah, you, know, you couldn't buy pieces of chicken when I was a kid. You'd go and buy a whole chicken and you'd uh, roast okay. it, um, and uh, or you'd boil it and pull it apart and use it in various things and so on. But now when you go to a butcher's or a supermarket, you can choose, well, I just want the legs or I yep. want bone in, fillets. bone it's out. typically the one that you, know, you go and look at the whole chicken display and 70 or 80% of it will be breast fillets. Uh, and then there's the other bits and pieces. And it's my understanding that it's mostly those increase in size of breast fillets. I mean, hey, you're this huge thing. You're going to go, does this come from a bloody turkey? Mm -hmm. <laughs> What's going on? Well, here? and the, the other tragic thing, I think it was Super Size Me Too is the documentary that I watched that covered that, where he is effectively trying to open a fast food restaurant, but be 100% transparent on 
everything, the right. ingredients, where the chicken's grown, how it's grown, how it's treated. And he shows all the bare bones and scars and, and the, all horrible, the hormones and the yeah. everything. Well, and I think he tries to do it in an organic way, but then it like, you know, he shows this is going to shoot the price up, blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. So it was really interesting, but they, yeah, they you showed pay that- you pay $40 for a chicken burger? Yeah. yeah well, they were showing though, I think on a yearly basis, I think it was a yearly basis, they're pulling back a day on the- amount of time it takes for this chicken to um, mature to be harvested and they're adding a certain amount of weight every single year to the chicken and that's been gradually happening since mm. the so they grow 1950s yeah but it's just insane you know because he has he goes to the chicken farms and then also talks about how all the um companies that effectively pay farmers to grow the chickens for them it's like it's almost Mm -hmm. like indentured servitude (laughs) where these companies set it up in a way that all the farmers are kind of fighting amongst one another to get a certain rate because it's done on a scale you don't it's not all of them are paid the same it's whoever gets the highest amount of meat for the least amount of food gets the highest rate and right. they can penalize you if they don't like what you're doing or if you're well, talking like to the, the wrong dairy people. industry as well, it's, which is it's owned fucked by, up. <laughs> Australia is owned mostly owned by two, you know, multinational conglomerates. Yeah. Um, and they are the the only thing they don't do is have dairy cattle. They yeah. control every yeah. other step. <laughs> well, when you open a bottle of they, milk, you're probably drinking milk from thousands of cows, right? Because it's yeah. just taken from so many farms mixed together. You know, it would be so interesting to do a DNA test on your average bottle of milk and see yeah, how many individuals yeah. are in there. Yeah, but it's that, you know, they control both the price that they pay to the farmer yeah. and the price they sell to the supermarkets, which is where most milk is sold. And and or to, you know, producers, well, they own the the downstream dairy products like cheese and ice cream and things. They own all of those factories. And that's how they can control the price of milk when it goes yeah. to the you know, actual milk product, um, where it goes to supermarkets. And that, you know, that sort of uh, oligopoly where you have, um, you know, two big companies that are effectively controlling not just the entire retail market, but the wholesale market yeah. that drives the retail market as well, you just shake your head and go, the, the only people who are getting screwed here are the consumers and the dairy farmers. The well, two everyone people else. In. Yeah. <laughs> but it, I think that's that's an issue we're going to have to overcome with globalization and a lot of these, what would you say, the these product chains, right? And working mm. out because a lot of the time it's the middlemen that are making most of the money and controlling the guys at the bottom and the guys at the that are at the receiving end. Yeah. of these things but the problem is that you have a population that wants to pay less and less and less for more and more and more yeah, and expect exactly. more and more high quality stuff mm-hmm. you know and yeah. i get hit with that all the time i'll be like what do you mean it's three dollars fifty for three liters of milk now it was three dollars the other week and you're like mate it's three liters of milk <laughs> for a few dollars yeah. you know you'll go you'll say that have a whinge about milk and then go to 7-eleven and buy, pay five dollars for a can of coke and you oh, don't no. even think about yeah. it and you're just like i'm such a hypocrite <laughs> like <laughs> anyway exactly. good place to leave that one thanks right. dad see you guys next time bye all righty you mob thank you so much for listening to or watching this episode of the goss if you would like to watch the video if you're currently listening to it and not watching it you can do so on the aussie english channel on youtube you'll be able to subscribe to that just search aussie english on youtube and if you're watching this and not listening to it you can check this episode out also on the aussie english podcast which you can find via my free aussie english podcast application on both android and iphone you can download that for free or you can find it via any other good podcast uh, app that you've got on your phone spotify podcast from itunes stitcher whatever it is i'm your host pete thank you so much for joining me i hope you have a ripper of a day and i will see you next time Peace.